Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of South Africa. I'm really excited because this is a country I've always wanted to visit and I just know a lot about just from my want to go there. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled. So we'll go over geography and history and then we'll flip through this book and look at all the pictures but first it is elephant week on my channel since all the countries that i'm covering since last thursday up to the end of this week are all elephant dominant countries so we're gonna celebrate with topple the asmr elephant and his amazing ears i'm gonna go like this up to the microphone that's up here and we can listen His little trunk ran over the mic for a second. Let me see if I... Oh. Oops. <laughs> Let me know what you think of that. That's Topple. ASMR elephant. And he's very sweet. Alright, let's get into South Africa. So... South Africa is very conveniently located in the south of Africa. It is the southernmost country in the continent of Africa. It borders Namibia up here along the Orange River. Up there. This is Botswana, also lots of rivers that make up this border, including the Limpopo River. Here's the border with Zimbabwe and the border with Mozambique. It has this border with Eswatini. This book's about 10 years old. Eswatini changed its name in 2019 from Swaziland. And then very interestingly, we have Lesotho right here, which I've already done a video on the history of. I don't think I'm gonna mention it at all. During the history of South Africa, just know that uh, this country refused to join South Africa multiple times throughout history. and wanted to be its own thing, so it is. And there it is. Same with Eswatini. South Africa has this big old coastline along the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean, and they meet down here in this area. Let me slide this up a bit so you can see all the words. This is pretty much known as the Cape of Good Hope, but it's actually right about here in Cape Town. The actual southernmost point in the continent of Africa is Cape Agulhas, as you can see right there. But the Cape of Good Hope is the famous one, mostly because of Cape Town. Cape Town, as you can see, is the capital city. South Africa has three capital cities. Cape Town's the legislative capital, and it has quite a lot of geographical features to it. First of all, out here in the Cape is Robben Island, which we're going to mention in its history. It's a very important island. And Table Mountain is just outside of Cape Town, which is, uh, it is what it sounds like. It is a flat, flat mountain. Actually, a lot of mountains in the southern area run like this, and it has to do with, um, the, the continents moving around in very, very old times, in, like the Gondwana ages, so... I figure it's like somehow this land got like, you know when you slide paper and it squishes? <laughs> I think that's what happened up here. We have some interesting little places in these mountains though. This area right down here is known as the Little Karoo, and up here is the Great Karoo, which kind of takes up that area. And in a nutshell, the Karoo is more of like a dry, deserty area, but not in the way you're thinking, not like the Sahara, you know. It's much drier than the rest of the country, but um, it still has some incredible plant life, including up here, what's known as Namakaland. This corner of South Africa has so many endemic flowers, which means that you can't find them anywhere else in the world. And they're bright, vibrant, and absolutely gorgeous. It's really incredible 
place to see when it all blooms. One of the many things that I want to see someday in South Africa. The main, my, okay, my number one bucket list. I know I mentioned the bucket list so many times on my channel, but number one is Cape Town because I want to see the jumping great white sharks. And um, I know it's not great for the environment. I know they're trying to find more better ways to see the jumping sharks that won't hurt any sea lions or sharks or anything like that. Um, but I want to see it so bad. It's so beautiful. I think sharks are the most incredible fish. They are amazing animals. And to see a great white shark fully jump out of the ocean is my biggest dream. I know I saw a video, I want to say it was in 2019, in San Francisco Bay, where I am, where a great white partially jumped out the water at Ocean Beach. And it's like, oh, are we just going to start getting jumping sharks? And I was like, oh, please, 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 please. That's my dream, is to see the jumping sharks in Cape Town. Number one top priority out of anything. If I could go anywhere in the world right now and see one thing, sharks at Cape Town. Of course, it's only during certain times of the year when there's seal migrations and the sharks jump up and chomp them. So, moving on from my animal fantasies, there's um, another place here in South Africa that I'm dying to go to. But we're gonna get to that last because it's over there. <laughs> Let's see what else is around here that I want to mention. We have, let's see, um, the Kalahari Desert kind of bleeds from Botswana and Namibia into this corner of South Africa. That's definitely the more like dry, deserty area. A bit arid. Lots of like goat herding and stuff. It's really kind of interesting. The Orange River flows through here. It comes down from the mountains. I don't know if I can see it. There we go. Making up the border there. It's the longest river in South Africa. And this area in particular is very important to South Africa because it's the mining area. We're going to talk about it in its history, but Kimberley is the like most famous mining town in South Africa, and they're mining diamonds, gold, and other uh, minerals and metals and things like that. We can also find the next capital city of Bloemfontein right here. This is the judicial capital where the Supreme Court is. Now let's talk about what's happening down here because this is a very interesting geographic feature. Again, another one of those continental shift um, Gondwana kind of things. Gondwana, if you don't know, was the name of a super continent that I think was like Africa, South America, and Antarctica when they were together and they split apart. Anyway, it created a interesting kind of moon shape circle of mountains known as the Great Escarpment, which is a great ASMR word. Escarpment. Escarpment. Anyway, it runs from down here all the way up to here, kind of separating the coastal area from the inland area. They get very, very high over here. These are the Drakensberg Mountains, and it's where all the very high peaks are. Even snow, too, down here this far south in South Africa. And, let's see, over here we can see Durban. That's an important city along here, known as the Zulu Coast. It's more of a uh, chill, kind of beachy kind of vibe down here along the coast, like surfing and stuff like that. Up here we have the High Veld area, and we can find places like Johannesburg, which is the largest city in South Africa. There's Soweto, we're going to mention that briefly in its history. And the third capital city of Pretoria, or Tishwane, which is the um, administrative capital where the president lives and works. Let's see what else we have. Well, that's the high veld. Over here is the low veld. And the Limpopo Valley is right here where the mountains sort of start to slope down get more into like the plains area and it's over here in this area that we have Kruger National Park it also goes over into Mozambique a bit and I think Zimbabwe a bit I'm pretty sure but this is my other dream spot to visit to see Kruger 
you can see all kinds of animals, including the big five. If you know the big five animals, hint, one of them is an elephant. Um, leave the other four in the comments below. I gave you one. Let me know if you know the other big four, which they're the big because they're the five largest mammals in the kind of like traditional safari areas, right? Let me look at my notes, see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. I don't think so. I think I got everything. I got all the borders. There's a little car going by. And yeah, I think I, I, think I got everything. Goodbye, little car. Let's dive into history. The history of South Africa starts about two billion years ago when a giant meteor landed right about here or so, making a huge crater and changing the structure of the earth beneath the surface, creating diamonds and gold, and platinum, chromium, among other minerals and elements and things like that. And it sat there for a very long time. Uh, some early peoples did find this gold and craft with it, but that would come a little bit later. The, um, the people have been in South Africa since forever. There's so many different fossils, um, mostly in like this chunk, but also along the coast. I should say the, the Great Karoo also has lots of dinosaur fossils as well, like tons of dinosaur fossils. But um, very early hominids and all throughout South Africa and very early humans. I want to say this is where the earliest Homo sapiens bones were found. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> There's also lots of really incredible cave art. My cough drops breaking down, so you might hear it crunch crunch. <laughs> really beautiful cave art. I'm pretty sure there are some in this book. There we go. The earliest tribes that we know of were the San and the Khoi Khoi, which are generally known as the Khoi San peoples. They lived, I mean, they lived all throughout South Africa, but today they live primarily kind of in this area here. And they are traditional nomadic herders living the same way that they've done for thousands upon thousands of years. It's very remarkable that there are still, you know, hunter-gatherers living in the world perfectly happy the way they are. They were eventually displaced by the Bantu migration between the 4th and 5th century CE. Many different Bantu-speaking peoples coming down, kicking out the song, saying, listen, leave. And um, down here in this area, they were famous for their ironworking. But many different cultures. We have the Zulu, the Nwosa, um, etc. <laughs> the, the Sutu, so many others. I, I could list them forever. And pretty much that's how things were in South Africa for quite a while. In 1488, Bartolomeu Diaz sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. He was a Portuguese sailor, the first European to go around the tip of South Africa, looking for a trade route to India. And the Portuguese would take a lot of interest in this part of Africa, mainly the coastal areas. The Portuguese were never really big about going inland. So they mainly dominated along the east coast here. They, they kind of came into this area, but not so much as they did up there. But when the Portuguese Empire began to weaken in the 1600s, the English and the Dutch were the big trading powers in the world, and they wanted to control whoop, this area so they can get to Africa, even though it was very dangerous to sail around the Cape of Good Hope. It's called that because you hope that you make it to the other side, you know? Um, it's still an important trade route because there was no Suez Canal back then. It was the fastest way to India and the Spice Islands. So the Dutch were the ones to get their hands on this trade route in this area. In 1647, the first Dutch sailors actually got shipwrecked at the Cape here, and once they managed to get back to Holland, they were like, you guys gotta check out this place, it's great, we can use it as the, a base, a refueling station, and we can even get some farms going. So, in 1652, Jan van Rijbeek established a little station here, which would eventually become Cape Town, and he brought with them a bunch of Dutch people to start farms, to start a new life in South Africa. 
They also would bring a lot of slaves from Southeast Asia, in particular Indonesia, Malaysia, um, and from other parts of Africa as well. That's kind of important to its cultural history. There's still a very big Malay population in Cape Town. We'll mention that in the book too. So these farmers became known as Boers, which is kind of like the Dutch word for farmers. And they started to expand, 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 explore, find all this incredible land until they got to about here, I want to say. The uh, Great Fish River, I want to say it is. And they came, they ran into the Mosa culture, who were like, who are you people? What are you doing here? Get out of here. And lots of conflict with them. Um, combating for pasture land, as you can imagine. Napoleon invades the Low Countries up in Europe in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So Britain, remember the other big trading powers, like, well, I just, I'd better go protect this area, as in take it over, which they did um, in the early 1800s. They occupied Cape Town which after the Napoleonic Wars, the area was eventually ceded to Britain. And the first British settlers, like the serious ones, arrived in 1820. The Dutch, or the Boers, I should say, were none too pleased about this. They did not want to be ruled by the British. The British were like too bad. So that's when the era of the Boer Trekkers began, which was when they packed up all their things, put it in a wagon, and they just headed out into the unknown to find a new place to live. And most of them settled around this area. Lots of different um, nicknames, basically just like the, the Veld in a way, but um, they established Natal, which comes from the Portuguese word for Christmas, thanks to Bartolomeu. Um, the, the Free State over here, and um, Transvaal up here. And the, Orange River, you know, the, the Dutch love orange. The color orange is like their whole thing. So the Orange River became the Orange Free State for a minute. And they started to set up farms over here. But what is happening over in this corner of Africa while all this is going on? The Zulu tribe, which is predominantly over here, is gaining power thanks to their king, Shaka, who um, apparently the story is that they learned a lot of agricultural tricks from the Portuguese back in the day. They could grow more food, their population boomed, and they thought, you know what? We're warrior people. They always have been, always will be. They've got all these innovative weapons. They have all these soldiers. Let's go conquer. And they did that. They went around and fought as many tribes as they could and either kicked them out or conquered and assimilated them and expanded the Zulu Empire. This is typically known to the other tribes in the area as the Mfakane, which was a very hard time for them. A few million people lost their lives to the Zulu invaders. Many tribes were displaced, had to move up to Zimbabwe, Mozambique area, which caused a whole other mess of conflict in doing so. It really upset the whole tribal network of this corner of the world. And then the Boers arrive, the Vortrekkers arrive. And the Zulus are like, um, well, what are you doing here? Who are you people? Get out of here. And these people were like, absolutely not. They started fighting with the Zulu, which is a bad idea. The Zulus were very fierce warriors. There's a really good movie called Zulu um, about a period I'm about to talk about really good. All the fight scenes have no music. All you hear is yelling and fighting and screaming. It's so intense. Oh my gosh. It's one of the first movies I saw. It's like, I want to say like 10 or 11 that I literally felt like scared. Like I had to like get up and run away. I was, I was actually like scared. Anyway, it's a good movie. So the, uh, lost my place in the notes. Yes. The Vortrekkers and the Zulu clash, clash, clash. Same with the Mosa as well, but the, the Zulus are a much more formidable foe. Um, in 1867, uh, some British people found a bunch of diamonds in the ground. And then in 1884, they found a bunch of gold. Like, what the, how did all this get here? Not knowing that there was a huge meteor that smashed into the ground up there. They're like, wow, there's tons of stuff in the ground. 
So a huge gold rush occurred in 1886, many other British people coming to get rich. And the mining industry, like I said, in the geography portion is still huge in South Africa. There's still tons of diamonds and gold in the ground here. And it gave the British a lot of power, not just up in Britain, but in the area as well. I know I've talked about Cecil Rhodes in the Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Uh, I pointed to the wrong country in Botswana episodes. Um, but he essentially established the De Beers Diamond Company out of the mines in the area and started that whole industry. So Britain sees that the Boers are struggling over here, right? So they're like, what if we absorbed your area? Mostly the, the South African Republic area over here, the Free State which resisted the British, hence the name Free State, um, took a little longer, but they were like, yeah, sure, like anything to help us. And that started the Anglo-Zulu War, and which was what we have the movie Zulu about. And by the time that was sort of resolved, the Boers down here were like, well, you can't conquer us. And that started the first Boer War. The Boers actually won out against the British, which was like a big point of pride. But then the British came back even harder during the second Boer War. This was in like 1899 to 1902. And they destroyed the Boers. They didn't destroy them. They, they won, right? So they took over all the Boer territory and said, you now belong to the British. And, uh, yeah, so the, sorry, I'm glancing over my notes. I should have mentioned it's more in the Transvaal as well. But anyway, the South Africans, or the British South Africans at this point, I should say, gained some independence from Great Britain in 1909, a little bit of autonomy, which would become full independence in 1931. They became their own thing, and it included Namibia at this point, I should say, which is all of this land. They took it from the Germans after World War I, because the Germans owned it anyway. And eventually become a republic in 1961, but just know that. So during this time, while the white South Africans were figuring out their new country, new government, they needed to do something about all the black and colored people, as they're known in South Africa. Because uh, there were a lot of them. They vastly outnumbered the white people. So they started to implement laws to segregate them, to make them, like, lower-class citizens. And by 1948, the National Party came to power, which was an Afrikaner party. And they implemented a system known as apartheid, which was a total, complete separation of the three main races of South Africa, white, black, colored. And um, they took a lot of inspiration from America and the First Nations peoples of Canada and kind of went to like the extreme to, you know, complete segregation in every aspect, as in like people were forced out of their homes and forced into places that the government called their homelands. They created different homeland areas out here and forced people out of the cities to move to them. Even though, like, these people are like, I've never even been here. How is this my homeland? You know, they had to carry pass books on them that said their race so that they could prove, you know, if they're in the right spot or not, which is horrible. Um, what else? There's so many horrific things. There was a um, yeah, there was District 6, oh gosh, I need to mention District 6 in Cape Town. It was a, um, kind of mixed race. It had black, white, and color people living together, and obviously they couldn't have that, so they straight up took all the black and color people and kicked them out and demolished all their homes. Just spoiler alert, they do get rebuilt in, farther in the future, but also I mentioned Soweto before, and geography there's a very famous protest there organized among like high school students like teenagers the police fired on them and very sadly you know, people lost their lives including children horrible horrible stuff there was worldwide protests they were banned from the olympics there were you know marches all over the world 
you know, not allowing business with South Africa, no imports, no exports, things like that. But um, it seemed like as the decades went on, the apartheid government would just keep doubling down on the racism. Most famously, you can see Nelson Mandela over here. He was imprisoned for his belief in that everyone should be equal on Robben Island over here. And it wasn't until 1990 that he was free. He was in prison for, what was it, like 27 years doing hard labor and everything. 1990 was the first year that steps were made to end apartheid, including releasing prisoners. And in 1994, Nelson Mandela was elected president, first black president of South Africa. He was like the hero of the nation, right? Everyone loves, everyone loves him around the world. A, a huge hero. And that was the official end of apartheid, obviously, once you have a black president. So, steps were made to change the country. Sorry about the loud car. It got hot in here, I had to open a window. The cars are going to be a little louder, I apologize. But, um, you know, new flag, new government system, new pretty much everything. And the country really held together. You know, when things like that happen, typically in a lot of African nations especially, but also in other places around the world when you have a complete restructuring like that there's a lot of disasters that could happen but really none of them did it just seemed like everyone was ready to heal and move on not everyone there are still some racists out there but anyway pretty much the majority of the population was ready to move on as one cohesive country you know which was great the the 90s was really overpowered after the whole apartheid thing um, really dominated by the HIV AIDS crisis in South Africa, which South Africa has done so much to try to combat and educate and even like, you know, help people live long, healthy lives with the HIV virus and all those things. There is still a lot of poverty. There's still a lot of racial tension. There's, um, I mean, there's still a lot of like crime, but, um, obviously not like it was before, so there, steps are being made to improve things, and while there have been some votes of no confidence, or resigning, presidents resigning before there was a vote of no confidence, a couple times in the history, the government has been very stable, so that's pretty much where South Africa is today. Um, I feel like I have to mention the World Cup was hosted here in 2010, the the soccer world. They actually call it soccer in South Africa. Isn't that interesting? But like football, you know, it's a known throughout the world. Uh, some absolute banger songs came out of that by Shakira and the Wave and Flag song. Um, absolute bangers. <laughs> and uh, South Africa also won the Rugby World Cup in 2019. I feel like all the research that I've done, like actual South Africans presenting facts about South Africa, that's one of the first ones is they won the Rugby World Cup in 2019. So like, I have to mention it, I suppose, but let's look at the book and we'll see some pictures. We'll see some pictures of the things I just mentioned. First of all, look at this cover. Is that not the most incredible face paint of the South African flag over her whole entire head, not just her face? Like she painted her hair. Incredible, incredible paint job there. That's really awesome. <laughs> There's a sweet face there. Looks like she's in a marching band, huh? Let me slide all this over. Watch out, topple. Watch out, pencil. Okay. All right. Let's see what we've got. Some sweet faces. Which, like, all the pictures of kids are, like, kids of different races coming together, right? A political map of South Africa. And a segregated classroom. You can see that there's a lot of black children packed in here. That's another thing they did was that... They limited the, the subjects and topics that could be taught in black schools. And the I think the one that really sparked the Soweto riot, or protest, I should say, was that the government wanted to teach them, like, only in Afrikaans, which, you know, these, these kids don't speak. And everywhere else in the world doesn't speak Afrikaans, just in South Africa, so it would vastly limit their um, capabilities of going out in the world and you know, being something. So that was pretty bad. Here's some protesters. There's a protester running from the police here. That's in Cape Town. Here's a march throughout Cape Town to end apartheid. 
and here's Nelson Mandela being freed from prison. Another picture of him looking very happy. And the little graffiti here looks like he's this person's trying to like paint it off, right? Some of the poor neighborhood homes here. There's still a lot of issues with um, water supplies and electricity as well. And that has to do with apartheid because the apartheid government didn't feel the need to provide black communities with the power to the electricity grid. So the, the repercussions of that are still happening as they're trying to restructure the whole electricity plan of the government. There's lots of rolling blackouts and things. A band playing some street music. Here's the stadium that was built for the World Cup in 2010. And here they are with their Vuvuzelas. Do you remember when that, <laughs> when the World Cup happened and the world got to hear Vuvuzelas for the first time? It just sounds like really angry bees. <laughs> Very funny. This is the Cape of Good Hope. Very cool. A physical map of South Africa can see so much. There's just so much to the geography of South Africa. I'm sure I've forgotten some important things, but uh, yeah, there's just so much. There's some of the Drakensberg Mountains. There's Table Mountain. Look at perfectly straight line. It's a very iconic mountain. And here's some of the beautiful flowery landscape up in Namaka Land. Absolutely gorgeous. Some deserty areas. I think they're like the Kalahari area. And it does get snow occasionally in South Africa. There's a wind farm. And some cities. Here's Johannesburg. Big, big city. And Durban. Beach city. Elephants. 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 I love elephants, if you can't tell. This is the Springbok, the national animal of South Africa, and their rugby team is named after them. There's a very uh, good movie called Invictus that talks about this event. Well, it's about this event when they won the 95 Rugby World Cup, and Nelson Mandela came out wearing the Springbok uniform, which was a big deal because the Springbok team, of course, during apartheid, they were all white. So, yeah, unity and all. You know another good movie about South Africa is District 9, which is a sci-fi alien invasion movie, but it's all an allegory for apartheid. It's all a big metaphor. It's really good. Even if you don't understand the metaphor, it's still a good movie. Some baboons tipping over trash cans and looking for a snack. Isn't that funny? A beautiful bird. This is a turaco, I think. It's a lovely shade of green. And South Africa does have penguins that live there. They're known as, well, when I was a kid, they were called jackass penguins because they make like a hee-haw kind of sound, like a donkey. So, um, I think they're just called like African penguins. No, yeah, African penguins. I think because they didn't like kids saying jackass penguins. I don't know. <laughs> Some more absolutely gorgeous flowery landscape. Is that not so beautiful? Here is some, um... Rocky landscapes here. Looks a little traditional. I wonder if there's some artwork there. And this was in Mapungubwe, which is located right up here. I didn't mention it. It was a kingdom in like the 1000s CE. They, they found all that gold in the ground and made some stuff out of it. <laughs> They're like, wow, look at all this cool shiny rocks. The King Protea, the national flower. Some more incredible plants in Namaka land. Very unusual trees. Here's some sweet, sweet rhinos. Very important animal to protect. Here's a gembok, another kind of antelope. Look at these sharp, sharp, pointy horns. And a sweet little baby lion at Kruger National Park. Some gorgeous, see, I'm telling you, this rock art from our very, very ancient ancestors is so pretty. Like, wow, like, let's go eat your heart out. That's beautiful. Look at the paint job and everything. They did fantastic. Some sun bushmen. I'm looking at something up in the desert. An old depiction of a koi koi home. So they have these domed houses in like a compound, which I think the Zulus still do today, like traditional homes for Zulus. 
Dutch settlement. So you can see they started out here and they spread out, spread out, spread out until they got to the Great Fish River and encountered the Hoza people. It's very Dutch buildings here, a <laughs> big old windmill. Here is a depiction of the Hoza people in these garb. Interesting. And here is Shaka Zulu himself, the king of the Zulus. I should say that pretty much all the tribes ha still have kings. The Zulus still have their kings and everything. They have a bit of regional power, but they don't like have any political power. It's just cultural power. Lots of Zulu battles. You can see some Vortrekker paths here where they went. This was the extent of the Zulu kingdom in 1817. You can see some British battles and some Vortrekker battles, or Boer battles, I should say. Here's Cecil Rhodes, who mined a lot in the area. The Boer War battle, British versus Afrikaners. And this is the first African National Congress in 1912. The first union to be like, hey, I think that not just, you know, black people should have rights, but all people should have rights. What a concept. At least back then it was. Gold mining and a luxurious resort in Cape Town for white people. Watch, I think these servants are black. Are they? Yes. <laughs> they certainly are helping out these white people. That's just how it was back then. It was the 30s. Here's a map of the different homelands that were created for the different ethnic groups. You can see that they're far away from the cities here where they traditionally lived. Hendrik Verward. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but um, he was a big-time racist. He kind of looks like Tom Hanks, but a uh, big-time racist. Pretty much created apartheid. Uh, boo. This is what District 6 looked like after all the removals. Isn't that sad? And yeah, they did manage to rebuild most of them and even get people who used to live there back into the neighborhood. A whites-only taxi. With the discrimination there. Thabo Becky, another um, important activist. This is in Sharpville, a big um, movement there. That's where the, uh, what was his name? I think it says it on one page over here. The teenager that was killed. Steve Biko, another prominent anti-apartheid activist. This is in Soweto. I'm going to say, please don't. This guy's ready too. There you go. We'll say his name over here. Hector Peterson. That's who it was. This is a memorial for him. He was six. He was 13. I'm sorry. 13 year old killed at the protest. And um, another guy who, when I said, you know, the, the government just kept doubling down on the racism. This was one of the guys that was doing that. Um, along with this guy, he was like the last major apartheid, like, enforcer before um, F.W. de Klerk became president and started to repeal all of it. And here's a picture from the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. Nelson Mandela. And there's um, F.W. de Klerk there. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu, another very famous um, anti-apartheid protester who, like Nelson Mandela and de Klerk, won the Nobel Peace Prize. See, they're lining up to vote for the first time in 1994. And look at this. This is a village in, um, where is it? Along the Orange River in the Karoo. It says, it's a whites-only village. Like, no black people, no colored people whatsoever. Only white Afrikaners. Only, like, <laughs> it's one of those, like, we have to preserve our culture kind of places. But I'm not going to talk about that. I don't want to get people upset for whatever reason. Casting a vote. This was the president at the time this book came out. It's Jacob Zuma. He was also imprisoned. I think it talks about it here. He was also imprisoned like Mandela was during apartheid. The National Assembly Building in Cape Town. That's where Parliament meets. Let's see, this is Bloemfontein, the judicial capital, and there's a map of Cape Town. And this is the president's offices in Pretoria. The provinces of South Africa, we have Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Northern Cape, Free State, Northwest. Um, it's pronounced 
Gauteng, I think. I don't think that's how you say it correctly. Oh my gosh, I can't even see. Gauteng, Limpopo, Ampumalanga, and KwaZulu Natal. The nine provinces. And here's the flag. Let me find my pencil. It rolled off a little ways. There. Okay. I've got it. South Africa's flag. South Africa's national flag, which was adopted in 1994, was designed to represent all the different groups in the country and unite them under one symbol. Hello, dog. Ooh, that was loud. Unite them under one symbol. The flag combines red, black, white, green, blue, and... Oh, red. I'm gonna go close the window real quick. The, the dog is much quieter now. Anyway, it's two in the morning. There's a dog barking. Who knows why? Anyway. The flag combines red, black, white, green, blue, and yellow in a geometric design. Bands of red and blue run across the top and bottom, and a green Y shape runs horizontally through the middle. On the left is a black triangle framed in yellow. The six colors represent the nation's racial groups and reflect the country's past, present, and future. The flag that it replaced included small versions of the British flag and two former Boer republics. It did not represent black Africans, the majority of the citizens, at all. There's some very excited rugby fans. You can just tell when someone's singing their national anthem by the look on their face. <laughs> Especially that guy. That's an aggressive sports fan singing their national anthem. So here's Cape Town. And Table Mountain is covered in clouds. And they call it the tablecloth. <laughs> oh, sorry. A little shaky shaky. They have a big automobile industry in South Africa. Here's a resources map. You can see lots and lots and lots of mining, right? A couple of farming over here. More mining. Got some gold there. Explosives. You have to blow it up to get it. I'm looking at a diamond there some shopping over here, big hustle bustle, currency, they use the South African Rand, and a little outdoor market, find some good food there, and a fashion model, showing off some South Africa fashion, some happy kids there, nice little smiles, ready to play some soccer. Uh, some examples of the different languages. So, um, South Africa has 11 official languages. Apparently, they have 12 now. No sign language is an official language, but you can see that's Afrikaans, that's English, and um, the others are probably Zulu and Mosa, but not positive. This is a San Bushman. What is he painting? An ostrich egg, it says. Oh, cool. It says they haul them out and use them as water containers. Very clever. This is Bokap. It's that um, Malayan neighborhood that I mentioned. Um, they paint the houses really bright and colorful. Isn't that neat? Here's a population map. Lots of people over here, right? And then in Cape Town as well. Not so much over here because it's very barren. There's another beautiful picture of bustling Cape Town. What's this movie advertised up here? I can't tell, but it looks like a car movie. They have a big film industry as well. Lots and lots of films coming out of South Africa. We're here by the Rondville house out in the countryside. Look at this picture. This is a little baby getting baptized by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Can you imagine? What a flex for this kid. The future be like, yeah, well, I was baptized by Desmond Tutu. So. And here he is. Very famous figure in history. This is a Dutch Reformed church building and a congregation of Zion Christian church members. It says it's the Easter celebration. We have some Catholics praying in their church. We have some Muslims praying in their mosque. And some Hindus celebrating Diwali. Awesome. I should have mentioned that, um, you know, I said a lot of um, Southeast Asian slaves were brought over once the once slavery was illegal, a lot of Indians came, indentured servitude, working sugarcane. It's true in a lot of 
former British colony. So there's a very large Indian population, mostly in like Durban around here. This is, um, where's her name? Sus uh, Helen Susman, a Jewish politician who is anti-apartheid, which at her time in politics was unusual. This is a Sangoma, like a medicine woman. She's got all her medicines here. And a cool hat. Doing a neat dance. Their little bead of jewelry and sticks. I'm blowing the vuvuzela. Here is Chad Leclo, very famous Olympic swimmer. This is Oscar Pistorius. I, he once was a famous runner before he, uh, uh, murdered his girlfriend, a kite festival, and a famous novelist, J.M. Coetzee. Another famous um, author, the Zach. Z I'm not sure how you say his name actually. I feel bad because he's very well known. Anyway, that that's him. This is from the Broadway play War Horse. The puppets are designed in South Africa, and here's Charlize Theron, very famous actress from South Africa. Here's Lady Smith Black Mombazo, which after I got this book and I was flipping through it, I saw this picture. I got Paul Simon in my head because they recorded songs with Paul Simon and it's been in my head for ages. Oh my gosh. Celebrating a New Year's parade <laughs> and the traditional reed dance that actually a lot of African cultures do in this corner of Africa, but this is a Zulu one. I mentioned it in the Lesotho, right? Yeah. No. Swaziland. Eswatini. Anyway, I think they, no, Eswatini. It was Eswatini, I remember now. They have a re dance also. A sweet family here. Uh, oh, I think it's in the ballet. Have these cool, like, um, beadwork, like, all over. I'm pretty sure that's in the ballet. If not, it's, then it's Zulu from the Shields, but I'm not positive. Some, um, sausages. Um, I don't remember how to pronounce this. It's super Afrikaans-y. Babotai or something like that, but that looks delicious. My goodness. That looks yummy. <laughs> and, uh, here's a affluent neighborhood. You can see Table Mountain right there. Um, faster way to bring home some water. Just roll it into big chugs there. Lots of very sweet looking school kids. This is at the University of Cape Town. It says it's the oldest university in South Africa. And singing and dancing, look at her singing her heart out in this. <laughs> Fantastic. They look wonderful. <laughs> and that's the end of our book tonight. So thank you so much for watching. Let me grab Topple. I'll have a whispered video about South Africa for you tomorrow with more Topple because it's Elephant Week. And thank you again. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. Topple, hope so too. And I hope that you, you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.